first order of business. <laughs> they got that guy in the red vest. <laughs> well, good morning. Uh, my name is Bob Mulder, as you probably know. And this is, or at least on July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and a little bit on the 4th, is the 151st anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. When I gave this talk last year for the sesquicentennial of the battle, I had just learned to say that, I think, uh, uh, we just, we decided then that it might be a good thing to do annually, or at least for a while. I'm going to do a couple of things a little different this year. Uh, First of all, among other things I brought is an old button that was found at the Battle of Gettysburg, which I'll talk about later. And secondly, an old Confederate that I found. <laughs> uh, uh, this is my friend Jim Head. Uh, Jim is fairly unique as far as I'm concerned. He's not only a historian and a very good one, he's a retired history teacher one of the few history teachers that wasn't called coach. And uh, uh, he's, he's also a very good reenactor. And historian and reenactor, at least in my opinion, don't always go hand in hand. But Jim is both, and I'm delighted that he's here. He will be representing, or is representing, a corporal of Confederate infantry of the 1st Texas Infantry. Correct. And we'll, uh, in fact, right now, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself, Jim, and your heritage. I know you've got some real ties back to the Civil War. And um, I'm originally from Maryland, a uh, little town called Sharpsburg. Um, Battle of Antietam was our backyard. Um, I grew up basically on the battlefield. By the time I was 10, I could give you the National Park Tour. Um, Dad, my, my father taught me how to, how to find artifacts. And when he was a kid, he and his brothers uh, would take five-gallon buckets and go out on the battlefield and just pick up stuff. Uh, after a field had been plowed and a rain, Everything just washed to the surface. They had a, a roadside stand where they sold things for a penny a pound. <laughs> are, are they still in business? Yeah. <laughs> We're about to uh, all the brothers, all the brothers have passed on now. Um, but my father did. He had um, a pair of bolts that met in midair, canceled each other out, and uh, we were at uh, we were up at a property one time at, at Churchburg, and he says, well, let me show you how to find something. He went over to this old tree, and he says, you can see that by the scar on this tree that a bullet has hit this tree. And he took a knife and dug into the bark a little bit, and sure enough, there was a ball in that tree. He could just tell by the way that the bark had formed on it. And so, um, growing up there, um, was a, a pleasure. It was, I mean, you got to play on the battlefield. And there were two uh, Confederate artillery pieces on our property. And up until about eight years old, I thought they were my cannons. <laughs> I didn't realize the National Park Service owned them. But I would go up there and I would cut the grass around them and I'd kept them trimmed down. I'd even go up and polish the barrels of the cannons. Because uh, I thought they were mine. <laughs> So, uh, there's a big disappointment when I couldn't take them home. <laughs> and so, uh, just growing up there was a, was a pleasure. You, know, you walk out your back out your back door, and it's history. And it was history all over the place. Um, all of my relatives uh, on my father's side of the family um, were canal boat people from Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Uh, four of them were canal boat captains. Um, let me see. It was just 
know, everything around us was, was history, and you just couldn't help but fall into it. So it was a natural thing for me to become a history teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't help it. I was sort of forced into it. <laughs> and I'm really glad I did. And it's always a pleasure to go back and we'll see the old property. We don't own the property anymore, unfortunately. But the National Park Service does. And so they'll keep it the way it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. You uh, had a relative that rode with somebody we... Yeah, uh, on my mother's side of the... Okay. My mother's side of the family fought for the Confederacy. Uh, he rode with, the, with John Mosby, uh, the 43rd Virginia Cavalry Battalion. And um, he was about 18. And he would be a farmer during the day and a raider at night. And so he wasn't very popular with the Union Army. They, you know, they hated Mosby's men and you know, sort of every time they caught caught one, uh, they executed him. So he was very fortunate. My father's side of the family uh, were in the Union Army. But they're the ones who grew up in Sharpsburg and they had slaves. And it was really kind of interesting that a few years ago, Ken Detweiler and I were going through some, I was doing a slavery project that, when I was teaching. And I asked Ken if he had any slides of runaway slave ads. And so he, we're sitting at the table and just looking up at the, if you've tried to look at a slide, just looking up at the light, you know you can't read it. You just see the, the headline. It has runaway slaves. So he gives me two slides. And I put them in my slide projector and I bring the first one up and I read it along with the students and just runaway slave ad. And then I hit the button and the other slave ad came up and I'm talking to the students and this hand goes up and it says, Mr. Hebb, did you make up this slide? And I said, no, why? He says, well, who's Colonel Hebb? There was a Colonel Hebb on the slide. And the, the slave had run away from Bardstown, Kentucky. He was believed to be on his way back to Washington County, Maryland, where he was raised by Colonel Hebb. My family is from Washington County, Maryland. So I went back to Hagerstown, Maryland, the county seat. I found a book called The Hebs of Washington County. This was really weird. <laughs> and I found he wasn't a colonel. His nickname was Cole Heb. And he did raise slaves, and that was my family. And so, but they all fall from the north. They're big. <laughs> Now, uh, one of them was actually wounded at Culp's Hill, wasn't One it? was wounded at Culp's Hill. The, uh, I am representing a major of uh, Union infantry. I used to represent a captain of un Union infantry, and the uniform shrunk. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I couldn't find a captain suit in a hurry, so now I'm a major. However, uh, what I'd really like to do today as far as discussing the Battle of Gettysburg is to give it a some touch, and I'll be pointing out things that I have brought from my collection that either were at Gettysburg or are very similar to items that were there. I am actually wearing a belt buckle and a hat badge that was worn at Gettysburg by this man, Captain Ezra Day Dickerman, the 20th Connecticut Infantry. That's what the 20 stands for on my hat insignia. This red, white, and blue ribbon he actually wore during the battle. It was given to him on the way to the battlefield by the Loyal Ladies League. He had been wounded at Chancellorsville, where my ancestor was killed, and went, went home to recuperate, heard about Lee's invasion, <laughs> uh, and quickly 
hopped a ride on a train full of pigs to get to Gettysburg in time to rejoin his regiment, and they fought at Culp's Hill. The star, he mentions that he got from the uniform of a Confederate ordnance sergeant during the battle. Uh, one would presume he was either a prisoner or a casualty. Uh, the picture is interesting because he's holding a hat with this insignia on it. So these items were at the Battle of Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg is certainly one of the more famous battles of the Civil War. And why is that? Well, actually, strategically, it was not all that important, I don't believe. Uh, Vicksburg, which was fought at the same time, was strategically far more important. But Vicksburg was in the West. That's not where the politicians were. That's not where most of the reporters were. That is not where General Lee was. And by the time of Gettysburg, General Lee had grown to almost mystical proportions as far as the northern press was concerned. Nobody could beat General Lee. Uh, about a year later, when General Grant had taken over the Army of the Potomac, during the Battle of Wilderness, I believe this was, uh, some young officer mentioned to him, well, uh, what do you think Lee's going to do? And Grant's answer was, I don't worry about what Lee is going to do. Let him worry about what we are going to do. So that, I bring that up because that was the mindset of many people in the Army of the Potomac at that time. The Battle of Gettysburg has been described by one noted author as the irresistible force running into the immovable object, which I think pretty much sums it up. Uh, Lee had, Lee's army, the Army of Northern Virginia, had just come off a tremendous victory, probably Lee's greatest victory, at the Battle of Chancellorsville about a little over a month earlier. Uh, the same author that I just quoted mentions that probably one of the problems was that Lee felt he had defeated the Army of the Potomac at Chancellorsville. He had not. He had defeated the commander, Joe Hooker. Uh, probably the Union should have won the Battle of Chancellorsville. But Hooker lost his nerve, and so it became a Confederate victory. As Lee invaded Pennsylvania, several things had changed, which I'm not sure he completely understood, because he had such faith in his army, and uh, deservedly. But once he crossed the border into Pennsylvania, he lost a couple of advantages that he'd always had in Virginia and to some extent Maryland. All the farmers, well, most anyway, uh, in the Virginia and the Maryland areas where he had been campaigning before had, were, were Southern sympathizers. They, in effect, became spies for him. Uh, they also knew the country, as did many of his own soldiers. Once he crossed the border, the average farmer was either neutral or pro-union. And if they were neutral, the first time a Confederate uh, gave them some useless script for their cow, they became pro-union. <laughs> and uh, so therefore, they were not going to tell him what was going on. They were going to tell somebody in the Union Army what was going on. Even though there were a few people in his army that knew some of the roads and whatnot in the Gettysburg area, a man named Wesley Culp, probably 
would have been able to help him. Wesley Culp was later killed at Culp's Hill, which was, and we won't go into where that is, but that is uh, the fish hook of the fish hook line. Uh, but he was a private. Lee probably didn't even know he existed. Uh, so he lost the guides that he had depended on in the Virginia campaign. He had lost the help of the local populace, or at least most of it. And on top of that, he was now the aggressor. Now the Union troops were fighting to protect their home own land and their own property. So things sort of got reversed. And I'm not implying that Lee wasn't smart enough to know that. He certainly was. But the impact of all those things were probably a little bit more than he had anticipated uh, when he went into the campaign. Well, we, it is. Let's go to the next slide. The campaign started with the Confederates down here near Fredericksburg, and the Union was down there. And the Union commander at this time was Joe Hooker, still was Joe Hooker. Somewhat uncharacteristically for Joe Hooker, he moved fairly quickly. He got into a argument with General Halleck, who was the commander-in-chief, about what to do with the garrison at Harper's Ferry. And Hooker made the unfortunate statement of saying, "If you basically, if you do not follow my suggestions, I will resign. To which Lincoln and Halleck said, okie dokie. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of Joe Hooker. Three days before the commencement of the battle at Gettysburg, the Union had a brand new commander, General George Meade. Can we scoot ahead? Do you want to go to the... the yeah, generals? yeah, go, go to the pictures if you want. Um, who do you want to see? Well, George Meade, let's go. And then we'll have to go back. Okay, sure. Uh, Probably the, the Union won the Battle of Nicknames. Uh, George Meade was referred to as that old snapping turtle. And you can sort of see why. He really didn't want command of the Army. But he was ordered to take it. He, he had been commander and was commander at the time of the Union 5th Army Corps and literally did not know where the rest of his army was. There was no reason for him to know. He knew where his corps was. Luckily, the Union had a pretty efficient staff operation. Uh, even General Butterfield, who was the chief of staff, and after the battle uh, tried to stab Meade in the back, uh, he was efficient. He could tell Meade where the rest of the army was and where they were moving. My supposition is that if the same thing had happened to the Confederate Army, there would have probably been chaos because Lee had a minuscule staff. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one major and one lieutenant colonel, something like that. That's about it. Yeah. yeah, that was it. Uh, he had a chief of cavalry man named Stuart, but Stuart was off riding around someplace. He had a chief of artillery, but he was basically ineffectual. So he had a staff of about two men, and they were junior officers, whereas Meade inherited a staff that knew what was going on and were relatively senior officers. And that made a heck of a lot of difference. Uh, can we go back to the um, Confederate generals? Oh, the Confederate? Okay. Yeah. What do you want to see? First, Robert E. Lee. There's no question about his greatness. But like everybody, he was not <laughs> infallible.
before I was so rudely interrupted. Uh, uh, there's no question about Lee's greatness. Uh, he won a lot of battles with usually inferior forces, as far as numbers are concerned. He was helped a lot in the early years by the Union generals that he faced, namely McClellan and, again, Hooker, also Burnside. That tended to change with the Gettysburg campaign. The, uh, it was his first, ended up being his first major defeat. And pretty much after that, with some exceptions, uh, he was pretty much on the defensive. But he was a very good defensive general, possibly even in some ways better on the defense than on the offense, although he was offensive-minded. And I don't mean offensive, but <laughs> offensive-minded. Uh, he was really very, very good on the defense. Okay, let's go to the next one. James Longstreet, his old war horse, commander of the First Corps, Probably more defensive-minded than uh, Lee. Well, certainly more defensive-minded than Lee. A uh, little slow at times, possibly, but very, very dependable. The, let's go to the next one. Now here's another nickname, one that I don't particularly care for. Baldy Yule. Uh, uh, a lot of people have, thank you, uh, a lot of people will say, well, if Jackson had only been at Gettysburg, things would have been different. I think Jackson was at Gettysburg, his ghost. Uh, right after the Battle of Chancellorsville, in which Stonewall Jackson was killed, Lee reorganized his army from two army corps into three army corps. He'd really wanted to do that earlier because two army corps was really just too big an organization uh, for a single man uh, ahead of each corps to handle. But he had to find commanders for these two additional army corps. And he chose two men that had served under Jackson. Jackson had certainly done a lot of good things. He'd also done some not so good things. One of the things that Jackson would no was notorious for was not telling his subordinates what he had in mind and then giving them direct orders with no discretion involved. Do this, do this. Well, now you have two men, Yule, and A.P. Hill, who had served under Jackson, were used, as used to that kind of non-discretionary orders. You will probably more, it affected you will probably more than A.P. Hill, but uh, all of a sudden now in command and taking orders directly from Robert, who was noted for his discretionary orders. Do this, do that, if practical. Uh, that created problems, as we'll see. Next. A.P. Hill, the other man that was promoted to uh, Corps Command, he had some of the same problems uh, that you had, having served under Jackson, although he and Jackson did not get along very well. Jackson and Hadley had, had uh, actually put him under arrest at one point. Uh, but he did save Jackson's bacon at the Battle of Cedar Mountain, where Jackson had wondered, I would say, into Nathaniel Banks, who reputation has to be as one of the worst Union generals, but Banks pretty much had him on the run until A.P. Hill came up. So again, the ghost of Jackson, I think, was 
to some extent prevalent uh, with Hill. Hill also uh, suffered from a disease that tended to flare up when he was under stress, a uh, social disease, uh, that uh, he was killed right at the end of the war, and it was probably a good idea because he was not getting any better. Uh, he had con contracted that uh, disease uh, while a student at West Point uh, visiting some uh, lower class houses in the area. Uh, and that affected him uh, during the battle. Uh, there's no question that when he was under severe stress, he got sick. I mean, there, he, he fought it. There was nothing he could do about it. But he, he suffered from the effects of that disease. Go ahead. George Pickett, a uh, recent author. I don't know, have you read the book, uh, Lee's Last Invasion? No, I have not. Uh, it's uh, by the, the author is a uh, professor at Gettysburg College. And it's, there's some things I agree with, some things I don't, but I love his descriptions. We'll get into another one in a moment, but he describes Peckett as a congenial idiot. <laughs> and it's probably fairly close. I mean, he... Last in his class at West Point. Yeah, last in his class. Uh, enjoyed the loyalty of Longstreet, which I never quite figured out, but uh, uh, I guess mainly because he did follow orders and obsessed with any kind of imagination that would allow him to deviate from orders very much. Uh, he, of course, is most noted for Pickett's Charge. It really wasn't even Pickett's Charge. Uh, it was Longstreet's advance. He commanded one division of that advance, but history knows him as the leader of Pickett's charge. And uh, the failure of that charge, I, I don't think, can be pointed to uh, Pickett. He did what he was told to do. Right. Next. We already talked about the old snapping turtle. Next. John Buford. John Buford, in my estimation, was the Union general that saved Gettysburg. Without Buford, there probably wouldn't have been a battle at Gettysburg. It would have been someplace else. Uh, we've gone past the map, but let me briefly show what happened here. We have another one. Here. Go ahead. Can I use this? Yeah, or? go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this is Gettysburg. Whoops. This is Gettysburg. Confederates are over there, the majority of them. Buford shows up here on the 30th of June. He is commanding cavalry. He knows there's something out here. He puts his cavalry on her ridge, which is out here someplace, and sends out scouts both west of Gettysburg and north of Gettysburg. The Confederate Army is converging on Gettysburg. If we can, let's go ahead to yeah, that sure. map. Her Ridge, oh, I got one of these, and yeah, I'll get to poke holes yeah. in it with my sword. Sure. Uh, Her Ridge is here. This is the Chambersburg Pike. Buford arranges his men here and also has scouts all the way around here. On the evening of the 30th, Lee's army is approaching from Chambersburg towards Gettysburg, not to get shoes. Uh, this is the most misrepresented item 
about Gettysburg. Well, Lee went there to get shoes. No, he didn't. First of all, there's no shoe factory in Gettysburg. There was no shoe warehouse in Gettysburg. That myth probably started well after the war when General Heath, who commanded the advance division, said in his report, and he was really trying to cover his butt here, well, I sent reconnaissance into uh, a reconnaissance in force to get supplies and shoes. Well, that's uh, that was a nice story, uh, which I didn't mention uh, earlier on is that Lee had said Stuart and his cavalry out as he was going up the valley out to cover his right flank. Stuart allowed the Union Army to get between him and the Confederate Army, so he was not able to report back as to what was happening. Whether he was following orders, whether he was off on a raid, we can argue that all day long. The fact was, he wasn't there. The other problem was, and I think this is his biggest problem, he was chief of cavalry. He should have stayed with Lee and let his subordinates take the raid or the scouting. Because he left two brigades of cavalry there, but they were his most inefficient brigades. And there was nobody really to tell him what to do. And so they basically didn't do anything. So Lee was left as he was advancing towards Gettysburg without cavalry. Cavalry, in Civil War terms, is the eyes of the army. Their main purpose is to scout, screen, in other words, prevent the enemy cavalry from seeing what is going on, and report back. By Stuart's actions, he prevented all of these things from happening. I don't think he was responsible for the Confederate defeat, but he certainly didn't help things. Anyway, Heth, originally on the, the night of the 30th, sends a brigade of infantry, doesn't have any cavalry with him, to see what's going on in Gettysburg. What he sees is Buford's cavalry. He reports back to Heath and to Hill and said, there are regulars in Gettysburg. They both say, no, there can't be. This must be just militia. And they said, no, I mean, the, the, these are real guys, right? No, they must be militia. So the next morning, even though A.P. Hill has had instructions from, as also as Ewell, and we'll get into Ewell in a minute, instructions from Lee not to bring on a general engagement until my entire army is up, he moves two brigades up the Chambersburg Pike, and he runs into Buford's cavalry. Now, I'm sure most of us think of cavalry as fighting on horseback. Uh, yes, there was some of that but not so much in the Civil War. Buford adopted what is known as dragoon tactic. He dismounted his cavalry, three quarters of it, he had to leave one quarter on horseback to hold the horses, and distributed them on foot as infantry. He was also doing something that is right out of the Dragoon Handbook. He was, he quickly saw that the area to defend was here. But he knew he could not defend that with his two brigades of cavalry. So he starts defending her ridge. He then falls back to McPherson's ridge, eventually the Seminary Ridge all the time, buying time for the Union infantry to come up. Again, without Buford, 
there wouldn't have been a battle at Gettysburg. It would have been someplace else. But the Confederates would have accomplished the main reason for going to Gettysburg, which was the road hub. Five major roads go into Gettysburg. From there, he could have gone just about any place he wanted to. So the battle starts the first day out here. The cavalry retreats, and John Reynolds, can we go to the pictures again? John Reynolds with the first, there he is, uh, with the first corps, comes up and takes position. John Reynolds has been described by most, most authors as probably being the best general in the Union Army, at least at that time. He had been offered command of the Army of the Potomac, but had refused it because of the politics involved. Uh, unfortunately, George Meade wasn't offered the choice. He was just ordered to be there. Reynolds shows up and give me that quote from the movie of Gettysburg. Uh, John Reynolds brings his the first corps up and the Confederates are not aware that Union infantry has, has come up to back up the cavalry. So uh, Reynolds and Buford are riding along talking and so they're getting ready to go into position and Reynolds turns to Buford and says, let's go surprise Harry Heath. And surprise him they did because the first corps of the Army of the Potomac, arguably the best corps of the Army of the Potomac, called the Black Hat Boys because instead of the forage cap or cape like this, most of them wore a black dress hat with a round red insignia on it, which was the insignia of the 1st Division of the 1st Corps, swarmed in. As the Confederates saw what they were up again, supposedly somebody said, that ain't no militia, it's them damn black hat boys. It's the Army of the Potomac. And indeed it was. Uh, Buford, unfortunately, is killed almost immediately, within an hour, I think. Reynolds. 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 Well, it sounds a lot alike. <laughs> <laughs> I pointed to Reynolds. Okay, Reynolds. <laughs> That's right. Excuse me. Reynolds is killed almost immediately. Within an hour, uh, may, maybe less. Uh, I don't think he was uh, pointed out as a target, but there's a guy on horseback. Might as well shoot at him. He's a bigger target. And that could have changed the whole battle. It didn't. Uh, his second in command, a man named Doubleday, took over. And uh, other than being given credit for uh, inventing the game of baseball, which Doubleday did not. Uh, he was an average general, but he did all right there. What else we got? Howard. Howard now shows up. He commands the 11th Corps, and he sees that, or he's told that Reynolds has been killed, can we go back to the map again? Yeah. Uh, he is told that Reynolds has been killed, so he takes command. Reynolds has backed up the cavalry, originally on McPherson's Ridge, and they're starting to fall back to Seminary Ridge. Howard, who, because of the action of his troops at Chancellorsville, has gotten a pretty bad rap. I think he was better than he's been given credit for. He sees what's happening. He extends the line of the First Corps, which is about here, to the right beyond Gettysburg. But he leaves a division here on Cemetery Hill. He realizes what Buford's trying to do and what Reynolds is trying to do. They are trying to delay the advance so that they can bring all their troops up on the best defensive position, which is Cemetery Hill, 
Colts Hill over here, down Cemetery Ridge, and eventually the Little Round Top. Unfortunately, one of his division commanders, Barlow, pushes out way too far. About the same time as he does that, General Ewell, old Baldy Ewell, who's been recalled from the Harrisburg area, arrives on the scene, roughly over here. And again, he's under orders not to bring on a general engagement, but obviously there's a lot of fighting going on, so he just bails into them. Eventually, the combination of J.P. Hill coming up here, who has now pushed in all of his troops, and Yule coming down here, forced the Union to retreat, and they end up in this general area on the night or evening of July 1st. Now, the battle on July 1st pitted Confederate troops who had a numerical advantage against the Union troops, who not only were, had a disadvantage from a number standpoint, but had also been really hard campaigning to get there. Uh, of course, the Confederates had two, but the, uh, the Union troops not only being outnumbered, had also been literally running into the battle to get there. Uh, the Reynolds troops especially. But because of Buford, because of some of the others, they were able to form up on the very land where they wanted to be. Uh, every, every book you read will call the first day of the battle a Confederate victory, which it was in Civil War terms because they controlled the battlefield. But actually what they had done is push the Union Army right back to where it wanted to be. The, uh, let's go back to the pictures again, there are the generals again. Ah, okay, next one. General Meade, not a real fan of Howard, who has taken over command. His favorite is Hancock, Hancock the superb. Hancock somehow always had a clean white shirt. Don't know where he got that, but always had a clean white shirt, and he was known to his troops as Hancock the superb. He was a very good general. But he was junior to Howard. But me trusting him more told him to take over command. So he meets with Howard on the battlefield sometime in the afternoon of the, uh, the first, and Ask Howard what he thinks about the battlefield. Howard says, I think this is where we ought to fight. He agrees and tells me that that's where they ought to fight. And so that sets the stage for the ensuing battles. Another picture. Sickles. Uh, this author of this book, uh, Lee's Last Invasion, has sort of an end, but... Uh, he describes Sickles as spoiled as a youth and matured into a scoundrel that oozed sleaze from every pore. <laughs> Other than that, he liked them. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's, that's pretty darn accurate. He was the epitome of a political general. He uh, what a lawyer and a politician, with all of that might imply, and being in New York City, being a politician, meant that you were a Democrat and you were part of Tammany Hall. He also was notorious for killing his wife's lover, who happened to be the son of Francis Scott Key. Uh, and there is no doubt that, what was his name, Philip? Uh, the son? I'm not, I'm not really sure. 
Uh, anyway, there's no doubt that they and Sickles' wife were lovers. However, there is also no doubt that Sickles had a string of women on his own. And uh, this is, some, my lawyer friends tell me that this is the first time that the insanity defense was used when uh, Sickles went on trial and he got off because of the insanity play. He raised a brigade of Union infantry, New York troops, that nobody wanted because of his reputation. So for a while, instead of being called the 74th New York, etc., they were simply called the Excelsior Brigade. Eventually, they were melded into the New York uh, military, but most New York politicians didn't really want them at the time. He commands the Third Corps. Next. Chamberlain. Probably most of us wouldn't know about Chamberlain except for the movie, Gettysburg. Uh, he commanded a regiment, 20th Maine, which was on the extreme left of the Union Army. During the second day's battle, well, there's no question that he did a very good job of uh, managing his regiment when they ran out of ammunition and he was on the extreme left, he charged bayonets and pretty much stopped the Confederate advance around the Union left. Next. Uh, one picture I don't have the air and it's on purpose. Uh, quite often I'm asked, well, why don't you have Custer's picture there? A couple of reasons. One, I don't like Custer, uh, but ba uh, mainly, Custer is given way, way too much credit for his actions at Gettysburg. I read a book recently that intimated that Custer saved the Union Army at Gettysburg. Uh, that's uh, certainly an uh, interesting history. Uh, Custer did not. Custer was involved in an action on the East Cavalry battlefield basically after everything was over. And he probably led a charge that he didn't need to lead. Anyway, no Custer. <laughs> uh, so, at the end of the first day, Union troops are basically here. But they stop right about there. As the Third Corps, under the uh, Slees, uh, Sickles, comes up, Meade extends them, the Second Corps is here, the Third Corps, under Sickles, is extended down here, and supposedly anchored on Little Round Top. Big Round Top is heavily wooded. There isn't any real position to take on um, Big Round Top. But Little Round Top is a key. The uh, 12th Corps arrives and moves in here. And the evening of the first day is where a lot of controversy comes. Lee gave a order to Yule, a discretionary order, to take that hill, Cemetery Hill, if practicable. Well, here's where the argument, well, if Stonewall Jackson was there, he would have done it. Well, who knows? Uh, if it's the seven days Jackson, he probably wouldn't have. If it's the Chancellorsville Jackson, maybe he would have. Uh, you'll be given a discretionary order. Is not quite sure what to do. He defers to his second in command, Jubal Early, that grouchy old man. And Jubal Early said, no, my troops are too winded. They are fought hard all day. We can't take that hill. I don't know whether they could have or not. There, most historians will say that at the very best, 
they had a one hour window of opportunity. And indeed, Early was right. His troops had not only fought a heavy action here, but had pushed the retreating Union 11th Corps and part of the 1st Corps through the streets of Gettysburg. Gettysburg is a maze. Uh, if you don't know where you're going in Gettysburg, you can get lost. And the Union troops retreating got lost, and the Union, the Confederate troops pursuing got lost and got shot up and et cetera, et cetera. Whether or not they were in any kind of shape to attack Cemetery Hill, who knows? The fact is they didn't. And I, I personally don't think Jackson would have made any difference, but that's neither here nor there. Well, on the second day, the Confederate Army is basically here. And well, not down here yet. Lee is looking for an opportunity. He sends out one of his staff officers a man named Captain Johnson, who was an engineer, to reconnoiter the Union left. Nobody knows where the hell Johnson ever went. Johnson told Lee that he got up the little round top, which they called the Stony Hill at the time, and there was nobody there. Well, Sickles may not have had many troops up here, but they were down here, and he certainly could have heard them, or smelled them, or both. So nobody knows where Johnson went. But Johnson went back to Lee and said, well, no, the Union Army stops right about here someplace. Well, during this period, Sickles decides that his position here isn't very strong that there's higher ground here on the Emmitsburg Pike. So without orders, he moves his entire core. They end up sort of like this. But he doesn't tell Meade that he's done this. When Meade finds out and rides up and uh, Sickles explained, well, this is higher ground. And uh, Meade has supposedly said, there's higher ground all the way to the mountains. Uh, there's always going to be higher ground in front of you unless you go over the mountains. And he said, well, I'll pull back. And by that time, it was too late. Longstreet, under Lee's orders, it moved around here, expecting to find the Union line stopping here. Instead, finds Sickles down here, moves part of his troops here to attack Little Round Top. By that time, Meade is moving elements of the Fifth Corps down here. Part of Longstreet's Corps consists of the Texas Brigade. Among the elements of the Texas Brigade is the 1st Texas Infantry, and I'll ask Jim to describe what they ran into. All right, thank you. 1st um, Texas, well, Hood's Texas Brigade was ordered to take Little Roundup, Little Roundup, as Bob says, with a discretionary order, if practical. So, Longstreet was against it in the first place, but he was against an attack altogether. So he orders his men out here. They cross over into Devil's Den. Now, Devil's Den is just all these massive boulders. And uh, it, was, it was probably a good place to defend, but not a good place to attack from. And so there's a little valley that goes between Devil's Den and Round Top, and there's a creek that runs through there. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so they cross that creek, and they start towards Little Round Top. At that point, 
Uh, Chamberlain and his men have entrenched themselves on Round Top. Uh, the rest of, uh, what is the Fifth Corps? Yes. The rest of the Fifth Corps has come in around them and is extending down towards the rest of the fish hook. Hood complained to Lee, or I mean to Longstreet, that this Union Army didn't even have to fire. All they had to do was roll rocks down on <laughs> And he said, it could have been that easy. But Hood, being Hood, uh, decided he was going to follow orders anyway and do what he had to do. And he attacked Round Top uh, maybe three or four times trying to go up Round Top. And his men got decimated. They were just shattered. Um, this, the uh, Alabama Brigade came in and resumed the fight. But by the time the Alabama men were finally driven off of Round Top uh, by Chamberlain, Hood's men were just totally spent. They didn't have anything left to fight with. Hood had been severely wounded. Uh, he lost an arm, or the use of an arm, at Gettysburg. And uh, he would later use, uh, lose a leg at uh, Chickamauga and have to be strapped into the saddle. But he managed to keep on fighting throughout the war. But Hood was a tough guy. But uh, the, un the uh, first Texas was pretty much had their butts kicked, if it's, pardon my language, <laughs> at, at Round Top by, uh, by the Fifth Corps. And so they fell back. And at the same time, Ewell was having trouble getting up Culp's Hill, and they were driven back. So the second day were attacks on the flanks. And after the, the attacks on the flanks failed, uh, Lee was just saying they weren't properly coordinated and that we will try again tomorrow at the Union Center. Yeah, and, and again, not anything against Lee, but trying to coordinate, this is roughly five miles around here. Right. Trying to coordinate ta attacks from both flanks, you know, without the use of cell phones, uh, uh, it's pretty darn hard. And I offhand can't think of any of those kind of attacks during the Civil War that really did work. I mean, it, it was just too hard to coordinate. What did happen is part of the 12th Corps, which was here, was sent down to reinforce this line. That allowed you will to take part of this position. But the next morning, again, it was supposed to be a coordinated attack between Pickett's Charge, if you will, and the uh, Confederates here. Uh, the Union opened the ball first thing in the morning to retake the entrenchments here. So by the time of Pickett's Charge, you uh, was all spent. The next day, as Jim pointed out, Lee wanted to do the same thing. But talking to Longstreet, Longstreet said, no, my, most of my core is too used up. Uh, we can support another attack, but it's useless to do this again. Uh, Lee was a little bit mistaken about how successful the attack had been. Uh, he observed, I can't think of the brigade now, Wolfert's brigade maybe? Break the Union line here. But they had no support. They, they didn't really break it, they bent it. Partly they were stopped by the 1st Minnesota. 1st Minnesota with 267 men was ordered by Hancock to stop those people for five minutes. They fixed bayonets. They charged. There were 1,600 men in that brigade. They stopped them for 15 minutes. And the 40-some survivors of the 1st Minnesota then came back up on the ridge. But Lee was misled by that supposedly success there and was going to try it again 
And after Longstreet demurred about attacking here, he decided to come straight up the center uh, in the so-called Pickett's Charge. Can we go to the video? Mm -hmm. This was preceded by a almost two-hour artillery barrage. This is a video from the movie Gettysburg. Are you in that charge? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got killed seven times. <laughs> uh, Jim was one of the reenactors that participated in the movie. Oops. I didn't get any credit. <laughs> just the face in the crowd. Well, we know one fellow that was there that claims if you look real careful at the movie, you can see him shooting himself. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, he played a Union soldier and a Confederate soldier. Is this Jack? Uh, Jack no, uh, this was Hockman, Earl Hockman, Earl Hockman. That, okay. that claimed he could. I never saw it, but whenever you're ready, mister. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, you know, my feelings are really hurt with all this technical stuff. Nobody asked me to help them out. And I'm here to tell you, I can turn on a computer. Right. And with a little luck, I can turn one off. <laughs> Without using ball being right. <laughs> That's right. right. <laughs> Until the movie Saving Private Ryan came out, in my opinion, this is one of the best battle scenes that Hollywood ever put together. It was Armistice. And what we don't show is the two-hour bombardment that preceded this. Confederate generals on horseback. They were forbidden to ride horses, but one of them was General Garnett, who had been arrested by Jackson, so the ghost of Jackson is still here, been arrested by Jackson and was going to court-martial him, but then again, Jackson was killed only because Garnett pulled his troops back at Winchester, I believe it was, to keep from being surrounded. But because Jackson hadn't ordered him, he must be a coward. In order to prove his courage, and because he was, I think, ill and did not, or had been wounded anyway. Uh, he had a leg injury. Yeah, did not feel he could march with his troops. He rode a horse. It was his last battle. But he wanted to erase the stigma of Jackson's uh, cowardness ac accusation. Just saw them going over the famous fence set on the Emmitsburg Pike, which probably had as much to do with defeating that charge as anything else.
uh, symbolizes Garnett's horse coming back without Garnett. This sword was found in the Baltimore pawn shop. Was it really? Yeah. My gosh. Well, that's, of course, that pretty much ended the Battle of Gettysburg. Turn the lights back on. Uh, well, I, I guess. That's it. Okay. Uh, of course, there was the East Cavalry Battlefield, which, at least in my opinion, uh, really was insignificant. But Custer did get the charge. Uh, there was also a cavalry charge to the left of the line by Judson Kilpatrick, uh, very ill-conceived. He felt that his cavalry could exploit the weakness that he was sure originated in the Confederate line after Pickett's defeat. So he ordered a cavalry charge commanded by a man named Farnsworth. Farnsworth protested. Farnsworth was killed, uh, as was most of his cavalry that led that Absolutely useless charge. That's the end of the battle. Lee and Meade both stay on the field the next day, July 4th. Lee is somewhat hoping that Meade will counterattack. And Lee's been, uh, Meade's been criticized for that, but because of Sickles' advance, on the second day, he was forced to put all, many of his troops in piecemeal by the, in order to shore up the line. By the end of the third day, he didn't have a cohesive unit that he could have countercharged with. And he was still sorting it out the last day, or the fourth, and on the fifth, Lee starts retreating. Probably the biggest blunder that Meade made was a telegram he sent to Lincoln saying, we have driven the enemy from our soil. To which Lincoln said, what do you mean our soil? It's all our soil. Uh, a Meade apologist will point out that uh, Meade was a Pennsylvanian and driving the Confederates from Pennsylvania, probably in the state conscious mindset of the day, uh, he could have meant that. Uh, don't know. Uh, there was a pursuit, but not very well managed. Uh, Lee finally escaped with most of his troops across the Potomac. That pretty much ended the battle. And the only thing I would like to add to that, since we're running a little late, is a couple of things. First of all, I've, we're often asked, and I'm sure Jim's been asked the same thing, why didn't the artillery barrage that the Confederates mounted, which consisted of between 150 to 170 guns, why didn't it succeed? Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, when they started firing, they knew where their targets were pretty much the Union infantry and specifically the Union batteries. But every time a cannon fires, it recoils. If it's on soft ground, which it was, it digs in just a little bit. Also, this screw here is what elevates or depresses the barrel. Every time the cannon fires, the barrel jumps a little bit, the screw goes down just a tiny bit. If you can see your target well, that's no problem. You keep compensating for that. Also, after the recoil, you push it back into approximately the same position. The problem is there was so much smoke generated that after a while they couldn't see the targets. And so they would be guessing as to how much to compensate. Consequently, most of the Confederate artillery fire went over Cemetery Ridge, created havoc in the back, especially with Meade's headquarters. He, he decided he'd better leave his headquarters. But uh, it really didn't have much effect. 
The items I brought here, in most cases, have a direct Gettysburg Association. This man wore this hat. Probably not a Gettysburg, but this is his hat. I have decorated it with, and he was at Culp's Hill. I have decorated it with the infantry insignia, which I just have sitting on there, and also a red star, which signifies the, I think, uh, the first division of the 12th Corps, which he was in. This man was also on Culp's Hill. And uh, I have his sword, which I didn't bring, but the sword was presented to him by the loyal citizens of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, for his actions at Stone, uh, at Atlanta. Uh, the irony was he could no longer use the sword because he lost his right hand at the Battle of Atlanta. The, this man here, Amos White ended up commanding the 5th New York Cavalry, which was with Kilpatrick on the extreme left of the Union line. This man, Patrick Nolan, this is his U.S. Army regulations. He was with Sickles in the 3rd Corps. He survived only to be killed again, or not again, only to be killed uh, I got wrapped up in this Ghost of Jackson thing. <laughs> uh, only to be killed at Cold Harbor. Uh, he actually lost this book during the Seven Days Battle, and it was recovered by a Confederate lieutenant whose name is also in there. This is a CS belt buckle, tongue and wreath was found near Winchester, where Early's division camped in 1864. I'm guessing that the owner probably was with Early during the uh, Gettysburg campaign. Jim mentioned where the Texas Brigade came in, and he mentioned the Little Valley of Plum Run. The owner of this pistol was there. He was in the 14th U.S. Regulars, part of the Sykes Regulars of the 5th Corps that were pushed into Plum Run to stop Hood's advance uh, towards Little Round Top and uh, through the Devil's Den area. He survived the war. The sword with the broken blade belonged to Captain Keenan T. Terrell of the 24th Georgia. The blade, I'm quite sure, got broken after the war, probably so he wouldn't have to surrender it. But uh, he was with the 24th Georgia, and they were active on the second day, although he was in the commissary department, and so probably did not see frontline service. Among the troops that attacked on the first day was the 24, uh, excuse me, 21st Georgia. This $10 bill was brought home by Sergeant James Cook, Company K of the 21st Georgia. And I know that because it was given to me by his great grandson who was a tail gunner on a B-26 during World War II, flew 45 missions. This is a facsimile of Sergeant Cook's uh, parole that he signed at Appomattox Courthouse. You know, just a facsimile, but uh, he did survive, but when, they, when Company K surrendered at uh, Appomattox Courthouse, he was the senior person present, in fact, in the whole 21st Georgia. 
Uh, this is a letter written by a member of the Richmond Howitzers. They were part of the artillery barrage that preceded Pickett's charge. This is a Bible belonging to this man. And this is his Burnside carbine. He was at uh, uh, with, with the cavalry that stopped uh, Stuart at the East Cavalry Battlefield. Brought a uh, 1841 rifle here. Supposedly Confederate usage, but the main thing is that this adapter was found in the railroad cut that I described on the first day's battle where uh, Davis's division or brigade went out the railroad cut thinking it was a great way to get around the Union flank. It turned out it was a death trap that was found there. A lot of historians give <coughs> Buford credit for stopping Heath's advance because he had Spencer rifles. He did not. He got them later. This is a uh, seven-shot repeater. Although the only ones at Gettysburg in any number were those issued to the 5th and 6th Michigan of Custer's brigade, but he didn't use them. Instead, he did charge. Not, not a real good idea. Uh, this rifle musket was carried by a man of the 121st New York, and it shows the red badge of the 1st Division of the 6th Corps, Army of the Potomac. He was at Gettysburg and along Cemetery Ridge someplace. They, the 6th Corps arrived late on the second day. His name is George Wallace, not the governor of Alabama. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, Jim has a Confederate made, a Richmond made rifle musket, uh, 58 caliber. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about it? You want me to talk about you it? You go ahead. Okay. You're on a roll. All right. Uh, this was made in Richmond, Richmond Armory in 1863. Don't know if it was at Gettysburg, but probably was. Could have been. Uh, it is missing the rear sight and the sling swivels for the sling. And I don't know this for sure, but my speculation is that that's one of the one out of ten that were that the Confederate troops were allowed to take home after Appomattox. Uh, one of the provisos of the surrender was that in every ten-man group going back home, they could have one firearm, but it had to be demilitarized. And you demilitarized the musket by taking off the rear sight and taking off the sling swivels. So now, at least in theory, it became a shot hunt. And it was, uh, they felt that uh, since all of that area was, <coughs> especially in the south, and if you ever watch Cold Mountain, you probably understand this, but there are a lot of bad people running around. Uh, and it was felt that any group of surrendered soldiers had to have at least one weapon with them. Also, they needed it uh, to uh, shoot game, etc. The uh, probably the most poignant thing. Well, real quickly, here is a, and I just got this. This is a Confederate officer's staff button that was found at Gettysburg. Don't know exactly where, but it was found there. The thing that I feel is most important is this book. This is Cowper's Book of Poems, printed in 1846. And on this flyleaf, it says, presented me by my beloved husband, January the 30th, 1849, and signed Philippia Field. 
turn the page and on the next fly leaf in a different handwriting it says this book was taken from the dead body of a confederate soldier by me during the battle of gettysburg fg patterson lieutenant fifth maine volunteers and they were stationed on cemetery ridge they were part of the sixth corps you assume that after the battle he picked this up off of <coughs> Mrs. Fields' husband's body. Uh, my feeling is there are no winners in war, only losers, only victims. Uh, sometimes good things come out of a war, the defeat of the Nazis, for instance, the defeat of the Japanese. Uh, and I won't say the defeat of the Confederacy because I don't, I don't believe that was the good thing that happened. The good thing that happened in the Civil War was the reuniting of this country. Uh, just think how history might have changed if it wasn't reunited. Who would have gone to Britain and France's aid during World War I? Or in World War II? Probably wouldn't have happened. In closing, finally, uh, I'd like to do something with Jim in honor of those veterans on both sides that fought at Gettysburg and other battles in the Civil War. Attention. Order arms, I mean, uh, uh, shoulder arms, present arm. Shoulder arm, order arm. Thank you. And thanks, Jim, for coming and Thank you. putting on his well suit. And, and uh, we ran a little long, and I'm sorry about that. Apologize. Uh, but I did want to give some time to Jim. And because I thought after the, the last talk I gave that it was probably somewhat one-sided and it wasn't intended to be, but I wanted to... The, to get the other side of the conflict involved. Uh, open for questions, yes, sir. Uh, there were an awful lot of infantrymen and cavalrymen, just thousands, literally thousands of them. How did they get support as far as feeding them and clothing them and taking care of their personal needs? Uh, cavalry specifically or well, all, all of them? In it. general. Uh, depends on the army to, in many extent. Uh, the Did Union Army, well, yes, the Union Army had, especially as they moved up into Pennsylvania, had a fairly good supply system. Uh, the Confederate Army, as they moved into Pennsylvania, forged off the land. Now they, I think it's a myth. Uh, well, there's no question that Lee issued an order that restricted foraging by his troops unless they paid for it. Uh, this author of this recent book, Lee's Invasion, said, yes, he issued that order, and yes, everybody winked at it, and if they did pay for it, well, what they took, as I mentioned earlier, they gave a piece of Confederate money uh, to a farmer for his cow, which the farmer couldn't spend, and um, didn't think that was a real good deal. And in many cases, uh, things like corn in a cornfield and uh, cherries on a tree and apples on a tree just seemed to disappear overnight. Uh, it's just it happened. So, yeah, that's right. So, yes. Uh, both things. Uh, they, uh, the biggest 
concern about, especially for the Confederates, was their ammunition supply. They could not forage ammunition, or at least very little. And that was their big problem. One of the reasons the barrage on the third day stopped when it did was because the uh, artillery commander felt he was running out of ammunition not have enough left to support the infantry. So the Union was much better off that way, at least at Gettysburg. When you started moving south, then things reversed, and uh, the Union started living off the land in many cases. Any other questions? Sir? I don't recall much about non-combatant or civilian casualties during the Civil War. What was the extent of uh, until the, the Sherman's march to the south, until that time, what was the extent of civilian ca casualties and civilian damage? Civilian damage was always fairly great. Uh, the uh, at Gettysburg, the only known civilian casualty was a lady named Jenny or Jenny Wade, who was cooking bread in her kitchen when a stray bullet came through the door and killed her. That's the only recorded civilian casualty at Gettysburg. I don't know that I can really answer that question. Obviously, there was more civilian casualties in the South than in the North because most of the fighting took place in the South. Uh, certainly, at Vicksburg, there had to be tremendous human suffering and casualties uh, just because the Confederates were entrenched around the city. And even if it wasn't intentional, and some of it probably was, an awful lot of artillery shells were falling inside the city, even if they weren't aimed that way. So the suffering there, the starvation that in uh, always comes about during a siege. It was 45 days or something like that. Uh, there were probably deaths by starvation uh, and, and certainly illness uh, brought about by uh, starvation and that sort of thing. I, I don't have a number, but it, it had to be considerable. Wouldn't you agree, Jim? I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, oh, 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 Fredericksburg, another example. Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta, another example, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Mike. Um, the July ended up being a real bad time for the Confederacy. Uh, Correct. With the West and Vicksburg falling and right. then Gettysburg. Were there Confederate troops somewhere between that could have been pulled one way or the other and made a difference? In either place? Well, th there's always that argument. Uh, actually, Johnson, Joe Johnson, uh, was given command at Vicksburg, but he wasn't at Vicksburg. He was to the uh, east of Vicksburg. And he was in command of the Vicksburg garrison. But the uh, commander of the Vicksburg Garrison was getting two conflicting orders. One directly from Jeff Davis, who said, don't yield an inch of ground. The other was from uh, Johnson, who said, get out of there. You're going to get trapped. Join my army. We'll be bigger. We can defeat Grant and then get back in. So there was some movement. But the Confederacy was stretched pretty thin. And when you move from one area, you always stand the chance of weakening another. And uh, what a lot of folks don't remember or, or think about is the pressure the Navy was putting on the Confederacy at the same time. You never really knew where they were going to strike. Uh, and plus their, the blockade. So they, they had to keep some troops along the Carolina coast and further south. Uh, and also there was probably a problem with 
Jefferson Davis's overall strategy. As Bismarck said later, he who tries to defend everything defends nothing. And it was Jefferson Davis feeling, at least at the beginning of the war, not to give up an inch of territory. And that didn't work very well. He just, he, I mean, he didn't have the resources. Other questions? Well, thank you, Bob. You bet. Great presentation. We're glad to uh, have anybody come up, uh, ask Jim questions, uh, look at the items. I would ask you not to handle them without uh, us helping out. But uh, we leave this set up for a while. Feel free to come up and uh, look at things. And we'll answer questions, and but only if Joe will go get me some water. <laughs> <laughs> Please.